All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our knowledge and benefit us with the knowledge we have acquired. Ameen. Learning about the biography of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encompasses many benefits where one can learn many lessons about the traits of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about his physical attributes, about his manners, his patience in proclaiming this da'wah to renew the call of Islam and other matters. In every day of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba learned many lessons. And since we did not have the opportunity to be amongst the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we talk about his biography, we live that time. We live these moments. We can imagine ourselves at that time and that will motivate us to be more steadfast on the path of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We'll talk about the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam huwa Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abdi Manaf ابن قصي ابن كلاب ابن مرة ابن كعب ابن نؤي ابن غالب ابن فهر ابن مالك ابن النضر ابن كنان ابن خزيمة ابن مدرك ابن إلياس ابن مضر ابن معد ابن عدنان. This is the lineage of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم up to this great ancestor of the Prophet عدنان. Up to here, all the scholars of Islam agreed on. They did not differ about this lineage of the Prophet والسلام, up to Adnan. Adnan is the great, great grandfather of the Prophet The Prophet والسلام, urged us, urged us to follow the traits and the habits of the righteous ones. And for that reason, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said once, اخشوشنوا وتمعددوا Umar radiallahu anhu said اخشوشنوا meaning live a humble life. Be content in your life. Do not look for luxurious life. Do not seek luxury in this life. Be humble, be content. وَتَمَعْدَدُوا Meaning follow the footsteps of Ma'ad ibn Adnan and that's the great ancestor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ma'ad ibn Adnan used to live a humble life. Throughout the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from his father till Adam Alayhi salam, it was all through a valid marriage. He did not have in any of his lineage at any time a relationship that was illegitimate relationship, adultery, fornication, never. Throughout his lineage, back to Prophet Adam alayhi salam, it was all through proper marriage. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said وُلِدْتُ مِن نِكَاح لَا مِن سِفَاح وُلِدْتُ مِن نِكَاح I was born from a proper valid marriage contract not from adultery or fornication. So throughout the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam back to Prophet Adam it was all through a proper valid marriage. 
So up to Adnan, all the scholars agreed on this lineage, as we mentioned. From Adnan, the scholars held different sayings regarding the order of the fathers from Adnan up to Ismail. Ismail, Ishmael, the son of Prophet Ibrahim alayhim as They all agreed that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came from Ismail. And they all agreed about the lineage of the Prophet from his father to Adnan. Then they differed from Adnan to Ismail, the son of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. As you may be aware of that Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons, Ismail, that's from Hajar, and Ishaq from Sarah. Ishaq, the son of Ibrahim, had Yaqub, Jacob. Yaqub had Yusuf and Benjamin. And the rest of the brothers for them. From the descendants came many prophets. The children of Israel all came from this channel because Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam, Jacob, had another name which is Israel. Israel means the slave of Allah. As Allah said in the Quran, Israel here is in reference to Prophet Yaqub السلام, Jacob. So that's why all the prophets from the children of Israel came from Yaqub. Yaqub is the son of Ishaq. Ishaq is the brother of Ismail. From Ismail, no prophet came except for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So through the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam, only one prophet came, and that is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now from Ibrahim alayhi salam, the lineage continues to Sam, the son of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And as you know, Nuh also is from the descendants of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. So that's in general, as we mentioned, the lineage of the Prophet goes to Adnan, they all agreed on that. From Adnan to Ismail, to Ismail alayhi salam, the son of Ibrahim. From Ibrahim goes to Sam, the son of Nuh. And from Nuh to Prophet Adam alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was chosen from the best of the best of the best. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Allah chose from the descendants of Ismail Kinana and chose from Kinana Quraysh and Quraysh is the great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some said he is Fihr ibn Malik and some said he is an Nadr ibn Kinana. An Nadr the son of Kinana. But that's the great grandfather of the Prophet, Quraysh. They used to call him Quraysh. Allah chose from the descendants of Ismail, Kinana. Chose from Kinana, Quraysh. Chose from Quraysh, Bani Hashim. That's the best clan in the tribe of Quraysh. And then the Prophet said, and he chose me from Bani Hashim. So he is from the best of the best of the best, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His mother is Amina bintu Wahab, ibn Abdi Manaf, ibn Zuhra, ibn Kilab, ibn Murrah, 
ابن كعب ابن لؤي ابن غالب ابن فهر ابن مالك ابن النضر as we mentioned according to uh, some scholars النضر is قريش so the lineage of Amina meets with the lineage of Abdullah the father of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم at Kilab the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was born in the year of the elephant why it was called the year of the elephant because basically of the great event that happened on that year when Abraha came to destroy the Kaaba Abraha was in charge of a portion of Yemen appointed by the king of Abyssinia at that time and Najashi and Najashi the king of Abyssinia appointed Abraha for a portion of Yemen in charge of it Abraha they call him Abraha to Ashram heard about Mecca although at that time Mecca was not an Islamic city at that time people used to worship idols and they had 360 idols all around the Kaaba but they kept some of the traditions that used to be practiced before like making tawaf around the Kaaba people used to come from different regions of the Arabic Peninsula to Mecca each year during the season of Hajj so that practice was still practiced by them although they were non-believers they used to come from different regions in the Arabic Peninsula to Mecca to turn around the Kaaba and they used to sell and buy and the like so Mecca was very important and people despite their state of blasphemy they were still glorifying the Kaaba and honoring the Kaaba Abraha when he heard about this matter he was jealous he wanted to build a place to steer people away from going to Mecca to Kaaba and instead he wants them to come to this place so he built in Yemen a big place decorated it with decorations painted it with gold and he made a very appealing to people so maybe he can invite them to this place but instead of people going to this place they kept on going to Mecca to visit the camp one of the people of Quraysh from the Arabs heard about his intention the intention of Abraha He's, he built this place decorated it it was called al qulais he called it al qulais and he wanted people to go to this place instead one of the Arabs from Mecca heard about this he was very upset so he went to this place that Abraha built and messed in it when Abraha heard about this he was very furious and upset he prepared a big army and he came to destroy the Kaaba his army was accompanied or led by a great elephant called Mahmoud that was the name of the elephant so he came and he reached the outskirts of Mecca when he reached the outskirts of Mecca they found camels and those camels were for Abdul Muttalib the grandfather of the Prophet 
He confiscated them. 200 camels. He took them. And he kept him, kept them with him. Abdul Muttalib, who was a well-known figure in the tribe of Quraysh, wanted to see Abraha. Abraha was so excited to meet him. So he asked them to let him in. And he made him sit next to him. So he removed the formalities between a king and a visitor. And he said, what's your need? Abdul Muttalib said to him, I came to you to get back my 200 camels that you took from me. Abraha was astonished. He said, when you first came to me, I glorified you and respected you. But now when you started talking about 200 camels, you want them back. And you know that I came to destroy the Kaaba, which is part of your religion. And you're not worried about the Kaaba. And you are worried about 200 camels. Now, you have lowered yourself from my eyes. Abdul Muttalib answered him, I am the owner of the camels. And I protect them. The Kaaba has a Lord, and the Lord of Kaaba will protect it. And since Abraha, his concern was to destroy the Kaaba, he returned the camels to Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib returned back to Mecca. And he asked his people to leave the heart of the city of Mecca where the Kaaba is and to go to the mountains, hide in the alleys and the like, so they won't be harmed by the army of Abraham. And he said to his people, we cannot fight him. He brought an army, and uh, it was mentioned that the army consisted of 60,000 soldiers. That army consisted of 60,000 soldiers. So we cannot fight him. And we'll leave him to what he wants. Because we cannot fight him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect the Kaaba. So they left. Abraha and his followers, the army, reached the entrance of Mecca. Abdul Muttalib, before he went to the mountains, because Mecca, as you know how it is, it is like in a valley and all mountains around. Although many mountains have been removed nowadays, but it's still like a valley. Mecca is in that valley and there are mountains around it. And uh, Abdul Muttalib, went to the door of Kaaba. He grabbed the ring of the door of Kaaba and he said, Ya Rabbi, la arju lahum siwaka. Ya Rabbi, famna' minhum himaka. Inna aduwa al-bayti man aadaka. Imna'ahum an yukhribu quraka. So it's like verses of poetry. That means, O oh my Lord, I do not ask but you and I ask you to prevent them from this holy place. The enemy of this house is your enemy. Prevent them from destroying your city. Then Abraha wanted to move forward. But the elephant refused to move forward. They hit the elephant, pushed the elephant, trying to, in vain, to make him walk forward, 
but the elephant sat in its place. They hit him, tortured him, refused to move forward towards Mecca. He turned him around to Yemen. He stood up and started running. He turned him back to Kaaba, he sat. He turned him to Asham. He stood up and started running. He turned him back to Kaaba, it sat in its place. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent from the direction of the sea the birds known as Ababil. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٌ Those birds had a beak and two claws. Every bird had a beak and two claws. And every bird was carrying three stones that are slightly smaller than a chickpea smaller than a chickpea bigger than a lentil seed smaller than a chickpea the name of each soldier was written on each stone and these birds started hitting this the army of Abraha with these stones Every stone goes straight to the one whose name is written on it. It goes through its head and it comes out from his buttocks with this person dead. And they were destroyed because of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. One of them, a minister for the king of Abyssinia, Abu Yaksum, managed to leave and the bird followed him until he reached the king of Abyssinia and told him about all what happened to the army. Then the bird hit him with that stone and killed him. So for the king of Abyssinia to know about what happened to his army that went to destroy the Kaaba. So Abraha was destroyed and his army was destroyed as well. And this happened on the year the Prophet ﷺ was born. That's why they say the Prophet was born in the year of the elephant in the year of the elephant because that event took place on that same year the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born as an orphan because his father passed away when he was at the age of about 25 and amina his wife was still pregnant with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From the root of Al-Irbad ibn Sariya, one of the great companions, that he said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, I am the slave of Allah and the last of the prophets I was known to be the last of the prophets when Adam was still a clay when Adam was in paradise as a clay you know when Allah ordered an angel to come down to earth and grab from all different types of soil he brought them up to paradise the soil was dealt with water from paradise and the shape of Adam was shaped 
and was left for a period of time as clay. The Prophet was known to be the best of the Prophets and the seal of the Prophets amongst the angels and Adam was still a clay. That's the meaning of it. So he was known amongst the angels sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How wouldn't he not be known? And there is a hadith narrated by a subki who classified it as Hassan that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah revealed to Adam the following, O Adam, if it weren't for Muhammad, I wouldn't have created you. So Allah created this whole universe to show them the honor of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, we are so lucky to be amongst his nation, to be part of this nation. We are so lucky. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and I will tell you about this. So he explained how he was known before he was even born. He said, Da'wa to Abi Ibrahim. Da'wa to Abi Ibrahim. The supplication of my father Ibrahim. When Ibrahim alayhi salam made supplication to Allah to send, to send a prophet from amongst them that will guide them and lead them. So Ibrahim supplicated Allah Azza wa Jal to send from those people of Mecca a prophet who will lead them. And that was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَبِشَارَةُ to Isa bi, The good tidings given by Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Didn't Allah say in the Quran about Prophet Isa alayhi salam? وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ So Isa alayhi salam gave the good tidings to his people about the advent of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what the Prophet is saying to show that he was known in the previous nations to be the last of the Prophets. And he said, وَرُؤْيَا أُمِّي الَّتِي رَأَتْ وَكَذَلِكَ أُمَّهَاتُ النَّبِيِّينَ يَرَيْنَ And the dream that my mother saw. And that's what the mothers of the prophets say. It was mentioned that the mother of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so when she gave birth to the Prophet والسلام, a great illumination of light that she was able to see the palaces of Asham. She was in Mecca. She gave birth to the Prophet. A great illumination of light came out from her, illuminated the horizon and she was able to see the palaces of Asham. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed by his eternal will that the last of all the Prophets will be Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another narration, the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, with that illumination of light, I was able to see the palaces of Busra. Busra, that's city in Asham. And she was able to see the necks of the camels in Busra as well. Now these uh, signs indicate that his mother was a believer. His mother was a righteous believer. Because there are many other narrations that confirm that the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
so many indications and signs about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So she was a believer. She was a righteous believer. And to be able to see the palaces of Busra in Asham, that is an extraordinary thing. And the extraordinary matters that happen to other than the prophets amongst the believers are called karamas. And the karama happens to the righteous believers. From this, some scholars took evidence that his mother was not only a normal believer, but a righteous believer. A righteous believer. His parents, Abdullah and Amina, did not live till the time the Prophet ﷺ propagated the revelation. Because he became a prophet at the age of 40. So they did not live up to that. His father died and his mother was pregnant with the prophet. Then when he was about six years old, his mother died. So they did not live until the Prophet ﷺ received the revelation. That's why the scholars said, the least to say about his parents is that they are saved in the hereafter. They won't be tortured in hellfire. Because Allah Ta'ala said, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah will not torture a tribe unless after sending them a messenger who would propagate the da'wah for them, then if they refuse to embrace Islam, then they deserve to be tortured. And his parents did not receive that call of Islam, so they won't be tortured in the hereafter, they are saved. Imam Suyuti and others authored uh, books and they wrote some treatises about the parents of the Prophet وسلم, how they are saved in the hereafter. Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu said, the parents of the Prophet did not die as blasphemers. Because it's not impossible that they have been inspired with the correct belief about Allah and about uh, the, the matters that pertain to the essentials of the belief. Allah inspired them. So they had that correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not impossible. There was a person called Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. This person died just before the Prophet received the revelation by five years. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 35 years old. And the Prophet ﷺ said about Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl that he will be resurrected on the day of judgment as a nation by himself. So he will be forming a nation, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. What's his story? He never heard the call of Islam. He went to the Majus, the Magi, those who used to worship the fire. He said this is not the correct religion. He went to other non-believers and he said, this is not the right religion. Then he started pondering about the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, there must be a creator that does not resemble the creations, a creator that is not a body or idol as those people are making and forming idols, making hands for them, face like a human being, and worshipping them, calling them gods. He said this can't be because the creator does not resemble the creations. Anyone who uses his sound intellect, he will conclude 
that the Creator does not resemble the creations. Because those who are similar to each other are susceptible to what could happen to each other. For instance, I'm a human being and you are a human being. I cannot be your Creator. Because I'm a human being like you. You get tired, I get tired. You get sick, I get sick. You get sleepy, I get sleepy. You get hungry, I get hungry. You die, and I die. So whatever could happen to you could happen to me because we are similar to each other, human beings. So Allah cannot be a human being or similar to human beings. Allah does not resemble any of the creations. This person, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, about whom the Prophet وسلم, said that he will be resurrected as a nation on his own on the Day of Judgment by pondering about the creations of Allah deduced that there must be a creator that does not resemble the creations that is not a body or shape or volume or quantity whatever is from the attributes of the creations he was guided by pondering about the creations of Allah. That's Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl on his own. So what about the parents of the Prophet? So it's not impossible that they might have been inspired, they might have been inspired with the correct belief in their hearts. That's why the scholars of Islam said that the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa are saved on the day of a judgment. On the day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, many great events took place. Al Bayhaqi and Ibn Asakir and others narrated that when it was the night when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born the throne of Kisra Caesar that's the king of the Persians shook and 14 of its balconies collapsed he had a big throne Kisra was the king of the Persians Caesar that's for the Romans Kisra for the Persians had a big throne that he had on that night it started shaking 14 of its balconies collapsed also the fire that the Persians used to keep ignited day and night for 1000 years the used to worship fire was put off on that night. Also, the lake of Sawa dried out. And there are narrations about the king of Persia hearing about what happened to the lake and witnessing what happened to his throne. And he sent uh, some to bring him those who might be able to interpret what's happening. And then they told him that a great man was born in the other side of the river, meaning towards the Arabs region. And they interpreted to him the collapse of 14 balconies that 14 kings of the Persians will rule and that will be the end of the Persian kingdom then what did he say he said by the time 14 kings rule Persia that is a long time but subhanallah from that time one died, another one came, and so on. The last of them, the last of the 14, died during the caliphate of Uthman ibn Affan. 
So in such a short period of time, in such a short period of time, so you're talking about maybe 30 years, the 14 kings died from the kings of Persia and that was the end of the Persian uh, Empire. The lake of Sour, ships used to sail in it. For suddenly to dry out, that was something shocking for them. Also on that night when the Prophet ﷺ was born, the devils were hit with the comets, shooting stars, on that night as well. And they were blocked from being able to hear any of the news from the angels. And some said that the throwing them with the comets and the shooting stars happened on the day the Prophet ﷺ received the revelation. Another thing was pertaining to Iblis. On the day the Prophet ﷺ was born, Iblis shrieked a loud one and he was so disturbed about the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Same shriek that he made when he was banished out of paradise and when he was cursed and when the Prophet was born and when the Surah of Al-Fatiha was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ was born on Monday, the 12th of Rabi'u al-Awwal, in a place in Mecca known as Suq al-Layl. Now they have a library, library, if you go there, you see a library. They call it Maktabat Makkah al mukarrama The library of Mecca al mukarrama In that place, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. So he was born on Monday. Some people may say to you, why do you commemorate the birth of Prophet Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasallam? Did the Prophet do it? And you know, soon you start seeing these messages on Facebook, WhatsApp, whatever, and they have pictures and with boxes, and they say, did the Prophet commemorate his birth? Yes or no? They ticked no already. Uh, did the Sahaba do that? No, and so on. They try to steer people away from commemorating the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We tell them that the Prophet ﷺ, by looking at what's the concept of commemorating the birth of the Prophet, what's the theme behind it? Isn't it when you commemorate the birth of the Prophet, you want to show your thankfulness to Allah Azza wa Jal? for being part of the nation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't you want to express your thankfulness to Allah Azza wa Jal for making you one of this nation? Don't you want to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for sending Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a mercy to the world? So it's actually a sign of expressing our thankfulness to Allah Azza wa Jal for being part of his nation. It's because of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we have become the best nation ever brought forward to people, bidding the lawful and forbidding the unlawful. Why we are the best nation? Because we follow the best Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this nation will enter paradise before any other nation. It's because of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this nation will be resurrected from their graves before the rest of 
the nations. So all these endowments specified for this nation are due because of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The biggest basin, you know, al hawd when Muslims drink from before they go to paradise, the biggest hawd is for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The biggest nation is the nation of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So don't you want to thank Allah, express your thankfulness to Allah Azza wa Jal for making you part of this great nation? So it's a kind of expressing thankfulness to Allah. That's what you tell him. This is the concept of Mawlid. That's one of its concepts, to express our thankfulness to Allah. Did the Prophet express his thankfulness to Allah on the day he was born? The answer is yes. How did he do it? He fasted the day of Monday. And he used to fast Mondays. When they asked him, why do you fast Mondays? And basically when he is fasting, he is fasting for whom? For Allah. So it's a kind of obedience to Allah, thankfulness to Allah. He said, this is the day when I was born and the day when I received the revelation. Allah made him the best of the creations. Allah made him the best of the creations. Wouldn't he thank Allah Azza wa Jal for this great endowment? We say, Alhamdulillah, Allazi hadana lil Islam. Wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. We thank Allah for guiding us to Islam. And if it weren't for Allah's guidance, we wouldn't have been guided. So don't you say, Alhamdulillah, I'm Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I'm praying. Alhamdulillah, I'm coming to the mosque. Where you find many are non-Muslims. When you find many are not practicing Islam. When you look at yourself that Allah gave you the power, enabled you to come to the mosque tonight, to attend the lesson, to pray in congregation. Don't you thank Allah for this great endowment? You do. You say, Alhamdulillah. And sometimes because you are so happy, you might go out, you see a poor person, and out of your happiness, you give that poor person some money, you help him, and the like, to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for guiding you to Islam. Because Allah chose Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be the best of the creations, not only the best of the prophets, the best of all the creations. Because the prophets are the best of the creations, and the best of the prophets is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he used to express his thankfulness to Allah azza wa jal by fasting Mondays, the day when he was born. So if the Prophet expressed his thankfulness to Allah in this way, fasting, if we on the day the Prophet was born express our thankfulness to Allah for sending Prophet Muhammad as a mercy to the world, by fasting, by donating to the poor, helping the needy, by praising Allah, praising Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reciting Quran, making dua, all these titles are generally recommended in our religion and highly recommended. So what is Mawlid? What do you do in Mawlid? You recite Quran at the beginning, then you praise Allah, then you praise Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then you donate to the poor or you give food for free for others. Now all these matters in our religion, are they bad or good? They are good. Reciting the Quran, Allah said, فَقُرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Recite. The Quran. Praising Allah, Allah said, Uzkurullah Zikran Kasira. Praise Allah a lot. Praising the Prophet, وسلم, Allah praised him better than any other praise. Allah said about him, Wa inna And Allah said, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما Allah is telling us that Allah honored the rank of the Prophet increased his rank raised his rank and the angels ask Allah Azza wa Jal to increase the rank of the Prophet so you as Muslims should also ask Allah Azza wa Jal to increase the honor of the Prophet and raise his rank so when we make salah on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam aren't we fulfilling the order of Allah Azza wa Jal? of course Allah said Sallu Alaihi Wasallimu Taslima and Allah did not specify when so whenever you have time, make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the day, at night, when you are praying, uh, when you are walking, any time you can make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are the titles for Mawlid, all recommended matters. And to say that the Prophet did not do it, and according to the false equation, Whatever the Prophet didn't do, according to them, it means haram. That's not even qa'ida usuliya. It's not in ilm al-usul. This is a kind of science in uh, a part of the religion where they talk about how they uh, deduce the judgment. None of the scholars said whatever the Prophet didn't do, it means it's haram. The Prophet didn't do many things. That doesn't mean they are haram. The Prophet did not build this mihrab in the direction of the Qibla. It doesn't make it haram. The Prophet did not build the minarets for the mosque. When he built his mosque in Medina, he did not tell them make a minaret. They were able to make a minaret. But he did not. That doesn't make minarets haram. The Prophet did not instruct the companions to compile the Quran in Mus'haf as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did. Abu Bakr did it. That does not make it haram. The Prophet did not gather the people in the mosque to pray taraweeh prayer in congregation. He didn't do it. He didn't lead them in the prayer and said, come and pray taraweeh jama'ah all of you. Never did that. Umar radiallahu anhu started it. That does not make it haram because the Prophet didn't do it. Uthman radiallahu anhu added a second azan on Friday. That doesn't make it haram because the Prophet didn't do it. Yahya ibn Ya'mar from the followers of the companions placed the dots for the alphabets in the Quran, in the Mus'haf. He, he's the first one to place the dots for the ba. One dot from underneath. For ta, two dots from the top. For sa, three from the top. And so on. He's the first one that made that rule of placing dots for the alphabet. That didn't make it haram. Rather, the scholars at that time praised him for what he did. None of them objected to him by saying, this is haram, the Prophet didn't do it. So, first of all, remember this. This is a false equation to say... Whatever the Prophet didn't do equals haram. That's not true. At the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they offered him a cooked dab. Do you know the dab? Dab is like a big lizard. It's an animal that lives in the desert. Now in Gulf countries they hunt them. It's edible. They offered the Prophet some food of cooked dab. The Prophet refused to eat. They said to him, is it haram? He said, no, it's not haram, but I don't eat it. So if he doesn't do it, it doesn't make it haram. That's very clear. He said, I don't eat it, but it's not haram. So whatever the Prophet wasallam did not do, that doesn't make it haram. So this rule is false. So when one says to you, how do you commemorate the Prophet's birth and the Prophet didn't do it? Tell him, same as you have mosques now with minarets, mihrab, you have dots for the mushaf, you make two adhan on Friday, 
you pray tarawih in congregation is saying. So if you were to say this is haram because the Prophet didn't do it, the same rule applies to the rest. Second, the Prophet received the revelation at what age? 40. He died at what age? 63. 23 years. In Mecca, 13 years of him, he was calling people to embrace Islam. His companions were getting tortured because they were converting to Islam. Because they converted to Islam, they have been tortured. And he was teaching them and debating with the non-believers, the leaders of Quraysh, about the resurrection, about the matters of the hereafter. In that environment, in that environment, would you expect the Prophet calling people and saying, celebrate my birth? He didn't. When he went to Medina, all the rules started getting revealed to the Prophet in Medina. Most of them. Fasting in the second year after the immigration, zakah after the hajj in the fifth or sixth hijri. So all in Medina. So the Prophet was busy teaching the nation the foundations, the rules, how they can deduce the judgment. So he gave them all these guidelines through which they can know if this is acceptable or this is not. For instance, in the hadith narrated by Imam Muslim in his Sahih, from the root of Jarir ibn Abdullah al Bajali, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever innovates an innovation of guidance will have its rewards, and a similar reward of those who practice it until the day of judgment, without the lessening of their rewards. And whoever innovates an innovation of misguidance will carry its sin and a similar sin of those who practice it until the day for judgment without the lessening of their sins what's this hadith give it's a general rule so the prophet divided innovations into how many categories two good innovations and bad innovations the good innovations are those that comply with the quran and the sunnah the bad innovations are those who do not comply with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. In the past, they used to perform Hajj riding camels, travel from one country to another on camels. These days, they use airplanes even. Now we have microphones. This did not exist at the time of the Prophet. Yeah, but still, is there any harm in using it? Are we using it? in a way that does not comply with the Qur'an and the Sunnah, no. But those people, subhanAllah, are so ignorant, very limited, not even one bar reception, nothing. If you were to talk to them about the rules of the religion, they don't understand. Although you show them what the scholars mentioned about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they still not listen. Although Imam Suyuti, Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani, Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani, and others wrote books about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But those people do not listen. We ask Allah, to guide them, insha'Allah Azza wa Jal. We conclude by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise Allah and make salah on Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us all say la ilaha illallah three times and make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La ilaha illallah.